Hello, Fast Fam. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd served Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their builds, and support both production and post-production. I have some cool stories to tell about what it was like to build these cars and to work with the cast. I was there, on set, in the production meetings, working on cars, hanging with the actors, and consulting on post-production. So follow along as I tell the stories. Let's jump in. Welcome back. We're going to switch it up a bit in this video. In this episode, I'm going to talk about this car, Eddie's GTR. Why are we talking about it? Because there's a connection to the Too Fast, Too Furious GTR. Back in June 2003, EA Games reached out to me about their desire to build a hot tuner car. Too Fast, Too Furious had just been released, and EA Games wanted to go all in with targeting the tuner market. Since I had created the Too Fast, Too Furious GTR, EA Games thought it would be a good idea if I were to help them create a GTR for their pending game release, which was going to be called Need for Speed Underground. This project was going to go way beyond consulting, though, on what the car and the game should look like. They actually wanted a real-life car to be built to promote this game. To this day, many people don't even know that EA Games actually commissioned a build of a real GTR in support of the game. Eddie's GTR, as we probably know, would be the king of the streets and would represent his entire crew, the Eastsiders. The game was set to launch in November of 2003, about the same time as Too Fast, Too Furious, which had actually released in June of 2003. This being something like the seventh installment in the Need for Speed EA Games franchise, EA had chosen to capitalize on all the success of the Fast and Furious by making this edition all about tuner cars. Around June or July 2003, I got a call from the good folks at EA Games up in Vancouver. They told me about the project and I was excited to bring their vision to life. At the time, I was Global Marketing Director for Magnaflow, but my good friend Neil Chin and I had started a small shop in which we were doing custom tuner builds. After a quick conversation with the EA Games folks, Neil and I decided an R34 would be the best possible car for this promotion for all the obvious reasons. Neil was able to procure a car from overseas and the car arrived at my house late July 2003. Of course the game was set to be released on November 17, 2003 and so there was lots to do. But first, EA Games wanted to send a technician to 3D scan the car and the scanning was actually done inside the garage of my home. As you can see in the picture, they used Pinstripe to plot the data points and a 3D scanning arm to chart all of the data points. The process took many, many hours. Once the tape was ripped back off of the car, we got a good chance to take a look at the car, and the car that Neil had sourced was absolutely stunning. It was a real GTR, it was white, it was white and had a nice TO4 T70 single turbo already installed, and with tuning and supporting mods, this setup would be good for well over 450 horsepower. At this point, EA Games gave us free reign to do what we wanted with the car, other than to say that it needed to be a tuner's dream car. Oh, and of course, the car had to be done in time for the big debut in November, December. The car would be shown at the SEMA show in November, so the car would have to be built rapidly in order to accommodate EA Games' ambitious promotional schedule with the car. The ultimate goal of this car was to give it away to a person in a special live television promotion. We were like, what? You're going to give this car away? Yep, that's what they said. And to make it even more spectacular, the car would be given away on MTV's TRL Live, which was a very popular TV show back then. But more on that later. Neil and I quickly worked up the build plan for Phase 1. The car would get some basic performance bolt-ons like exhaust and intake. New wheels would be coming down the pike. We'd make some suspension tweaks. Obviously, we are going to paint the car and we were going to source a prototype Bomex body kit from Japan, and of course, some NOS. Since Neil and I had a great relationship with Mikado, the owner of Bomex, Bomex was the perfect choice. Although the GTR received had a nice set of wheels already on it, they were loaner wheels and they were going to have to go back. We replaced them with HREs, the same ones that came off my GTR, which had recently returned from its role in Too Fast, Too Furious. Since the body kit was going to take four weeks to get here from Japan, the car went to Steve Demand's paint shop without the body kit. The body kit would have to be added to the car later. The car came back in just about a week or two, giving us enough time to get the HKS coilovers on it. Sparco seats were added, and we started working on acquiring the parts for the sound system. Kenwood was the major sponsor of the car, and they stepped in to provide us a ton of equipment. 
We didn't have time to get the stereo installed as our build plan was very ambitious. And so this wasn't going to be done before SEMA. But after the car came back from SEMA, we were going to focus very heavily on finishing that sound system. The MTV show was set to film in December, and of course, November is a SEMA show, so it was crunch time after SEMA. The body kit had finally arrived, and the car went back to paint to get it fitted and painted. And from there, the car went to the audio shop where a crazy sound system had been installed using all Kenwood bits, multiple woofers, Lexan, and a bevy of screens to showcase gameplay of what else, Need for Speed Underground, were all installed in the car with a lot of custom fabrication. The final tweaks included wiring up the Nitro system and ditching the big single turbo in favor of the stock twins as EA Games was very afraid that the winner of this car would wrap him or herself around a pole. About this time the car finally received its graphics and everything was wrapped up. Shortly thereafter the car went to the MTV studios in New York City where it was filmed for the upcoming promotional giveaway of the car. I don't have footage of that TV show, but what we do know is that a 19-year-old girl from Rhode Island or Delaware, I forget which one, had actually won the car. She promptly sold it to pay the taxes, and the car at some point wound up at a performance shop in Colorado, USA. It was rumored that the car was eventually exported to Alberta, Canada, but I can't confirm that. What happened to it after that is a total mystery. I do know that the car that is in Russia that looks like this car is not this car. Two different cars. Of course, the rest is history as the car ended up in the Need for Speed Underground game and was even on the cover of the video game. The car stuck with the Need for Speed Underground game for over several releases and has continued on to a point where it has earned a place in the pantheon of famous R34 GTRs. Of course, it was my honor and pleasure to work with both Neil Chin and EA Games, but for me, the greatest thrill is the fact that not just one, but two of my GTR creations have wound up immortalized in video games, games that have now spanned more than two decades. Eddie Skyline and my Too Fast Too Furious Skyline have even appeared together in one of these video games. To this day, I'm proud and humbled by the impact these cars have made on car fans around the world. Hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please smash that subscribe button, and most of all, don't forget to watch my other videos. 